Uh, the death of Tenak Patel, uh, an absolute tragedy uh, in Sandringham, Auckland, which has provoked, I think, a, a, a huge amount of soul searching in the middle of this um, ram raid epidemic, youth crime and lawlessness epidemic, and many questions being asked. And I'll be frank, a government seems to come up with very few answers to those uh, questions. Um, we invited Chris Hipkins on the show today. He couldn't make it. I must say that Chris Hipkins is one of the few Labor ministers who does front, so it must have been a scheduling issue. That's what I'm presuming. But we are joined now by Nationals Police uh, spokesperson, uh, using his phone and looking very good on it too, uh, Mark Mitchell. Mark, welcome to the platform. Good morning, Sean. Thanks for having me on. All right, and the audio's not bad either. In fact, it's quite strong. We'll just turn it down a little bit. Look, first, good news, uh, arrests, the people, the scumbags who allegedly did this are off the streets. That's got to be a good thing. And well done, the cops. Yeah, look, um, a yeah, huge shout out to uh, Detective Inspector Scott Beard and his team. Um, I saw Scott yesterday at uh, Janik's, um funeral service. Um, this has, of course, hit the investigative team very hard as well, working on these types of investigations. And he was saying that they apprehended or they took into custody a third person that appears to be somehow tied up with maybe driving the vehicle or something like that. All right, so it wasn't a random crime. It was a, it was a, um, a planned crime. There has also been speculation, and I haven't seen confirmation of, of that yet, that one of those involved, perhaps the stabber, was a 501, had been recently deported from another country back to New Zealand for criminal activity. Look, yeah, I'm not going to speculate on all the details because they haven't been released yet, and obviously the police are still in a very sensitive part of the investigation, and actually for them, the really hard, important work carries on uh, because they want to make sure that they gather all the evidence that they can so they have the strongest court, um, case to be able to present in court. So I'm not going to speculate on this, on the circumstances, Sean. In terms of the 501, yes, we have heard that as well. Um, and we will put in some uh, written questions to the Minister to see whether or not we can establish the, whether that was the case. Yeah. Um, Sonny Carshall from the Dairy and Business Owners Group spoke to us Friday, and he just said, look, this was inevitable. We told the government that this was coming. Would you agree that eventually a fatality in the crime environment the, or, or, you know, the level of crime the, the country currently has is not only was this death inev inevitable, but without significant change, another death is inevitable. Sadly, yes. I mean, you know, two weeks ago, I was in a media interview. I, I, I said myself, I said, it, it, you know, we kept, we're getting closer and closer, closer to a tragedy um, because, you know, there doesn't seem to be an end to this. And uh, look, at the end of the day, um, we've been saying for the last four or five years, Sean, that uh, there's, there hasn't been a proper response to the massive growth in gangs You've seen a growth now of almost 60% of adult gangs. And, of course, what happens is that you get the youth and juvenile offenders that are heavily influenced by them. The gangs, you had Mike Bush come out um, on a podcast 10 days ago saying that he's working with some of these recidivist youth offenders and they've been not only influenced by the gangs, they've been used by the gangs to go out and do pre-orders. Um, and so the government never took action early enough to actually get on top well, of it. Well, I was problem. giving them money to run drug rehab before they all got caught dealing the meth. Well, and that's been the other problem that you've just highlighted is that their priorities have been perverse in terms of coming into government and prioritising things like the repeal of the three strikes legislation, which was the only tough piece of sentencing legislation that we had on our books. You know, giving almost $3 million to the mongrel mob in the Hawke's Bay to run a meth rehab program that appears to be failing, uh, that's a huge slap in the face for the police officers over there that are working hard and having to deal with a lot of these people on a daily basis in terms of running criminal organisations and they watch our government give them $3 million. What's going to be any different under a national-led government? Number one, we take um, public and community safety seriously. That is our number one priority. There's, uh, we're committed to making sure that there's actually consequences that sit inside our system for these uh, recidivist offenders, um, and we expect the justice system to actually back our police up and understand that actually public safety comes as number one. Does that mean more police officers? Because that's just rhetoric, Mark, without some, some sort of policy to back it up. 
Well, you know what? At the moment, Sean, it matters. Um, the police need to get a sense that actually there's some strong political leadership and some strong polit- uh, leadership coming within their own organisation to actually back them and allow them to get out there and do their job. At the moment, they're out there with one hand tied behind their back. So, you know, that that is actually quite... That is, I know it's Well, how so? How hard. so? How, how would you untie that hand? Well, number one, uh, we put enormous pressure on the government, uh, well, political media and public pressure on the government to say that you need to review your pursuit policy. Um, you know, we, we've got... Okay, so if you were in government, you would review the pursuit policy? We, we, we would have asked to have had that pursuit policy already reviewed and reported back um, with an intelligent response to allow our police to actually be able to respond to these incidents instead of having the insidious situation that exists at the moment with offenders stealing cars, committing crime, not only driving past our police, throwing the bird at them and goading them into um, trying to catch them, but actually now driving at our police. And we've got a police officer in hospital at the moment um, with serious injuries because they were, whilst trying to get uh, road spikes down, were hit uh, by a fleeing offender. All right. Would you give more resources to police? Would you put more bobbies on the beat? Yep, we would give them whatever they need to turn the tide, get back on top of this uh, gang problem, start to make our retailers actually feel safer in their in their work of place. Yeah. In their, in their, uh, whatever their they need, does that mean a limitless budget for police? Well, it means that we're going to make the investment that needs to be made to give them the numbers and the resources for New Zealand to start heading towards being the safest country in the world instead of heading in the opposite direction. And we're fully committed to that. We've said that, and that's what will happen. Look, if I'm um, lucky enough to be appointed as police minister, if we're back in government next year, and um, and, and Chris Luxon has certainly indicated that, that is going to be the case, then um, that is going to, that's going to be where my full focus is is actually returning us to one of the safest countries in the world instead of a country where uh, we've got international recruitment agencies overseas saying that they can't get people because they're fearful of the crime situation in New Zealand. Which international recruitment agencies have said that? Well, there was. I don't. I don't remember the name of them. Go back and have a look. They were reported on uh, TV about a month ago. So a lot of things are reported on TV, Mark. Not all of them true. Well, they, they, it's direct quotes. You, you'll have to challenge them and you'll have to go back to okay, the Okay, but you don't know off the top of your head. Okay, you just threw it into the conversation. That's fine. Um, what about the ram raiding in particular? How do you stop that? And I also want to ask you, in a broader terms, would you be in favour of or do you think arming police or giving police easier access to firearms might be part of the solution to our current problem? Well, the, the way to stop ram raids is to start dismantling uh, gangs and start dismantling the uh, youth and juvenile gangs and, and start to actually get on top of the offending. It's uh, it's a perverse outcome and it's a last-ditch measure expecting our retailers to start to um, basically fortify their shops, yeah. work behind ages, and, um, you know, that, that's a that's a short-term bandage uh, on the actual problem. We need to get to- on top of the crime. In relation to the general arming, we've said very clearly that the expectation is on the commissioner and the police to come up with a, um, a, a solution whereby frontline police officers have got easy and readily available access to firearms um, so they've got that tactical option available to them because at the end of the day, they're dealing with six firearms incidents a day um, the, the, these gangs now carry firearms, they're more violent, they're willing to use them and it's unfair to expect our police officers to front up with a taser or a pepper spray um, and be able to deal with those situations. All right, now, so I, I'm just going to review my takeout. Um, you would resor- resource police better in terms of, of, of fighting crime. You would target gangs and gang recruit or gang recruitment uh, more heavily than we currently are? Absolutely. Okay, uh, you got the boot camp idea, which is obviously a bit about the crime and punishment, easier access to firearms, and, and I guess what you're calling a uh, meaningful support for the police to raise their morale, right? Yes, well, we've released a very tough package of um, uh, policies to deal with uh, the adult gangs in New Zealand. We've, de- we've released a very comprehensive youth justice policy to try and address the um, serious recidivist juvenile and youth offenders. Of course, the media love um, labelling it as a boot camp because they know that it's got a negative connotation. We actually, we absolutely stand behind what we want to do with yeah. those most And I've serious been hearing amazingly good things about the LSV scheme. 
uh, limited yeah, service. But, but it also seems to me, Mark Mitchell, from everyone I've spoken to, that that's a really good fence at the top of the kid if, uh, cliff if you get at-risk kids who might go off the rails early and send them to LSV. That can really turn their lives around. Not so effective as, it, as the ambulance at the bottom. LSV, look, I've been involved with LSV for 10 years. I've been a patron. Um, I've attended many of the courses. I'm a huge believer in it, and it's the cornerstone of what we want to deliver for these young people that 15 to 17 that are really close to going into the adult criminal justice system where it's much harder to turn them around, and they go into an extremely positive environment. The, the, the LSV program is, direct, is, is targeted at 17 to 24-year-olds, a lot of those young people have, have been in prison, they've been in trouble with the law, they've got addiction issues, and in, in a six-week program, you virtually see their lives turned around. Um, what we're proposing is a 12-month program, and we think that we could achieve outstanding results and actually being able to turn these young people's lives around, give them the mentors and the role models they need, the investment that they need, get them aspirational, get them making good decisions, and then and then stick with them as they transition back into the community and actually start to realise the opportunities that our country has instead of a fast track into the gang's bad decisions and into our adult criminal, criminal justice system. Can you end the gangs? We can't end them. Um, Why the reality not? Of Why is the gang- hell not? I think a lot of New because- Zealanders would ask, why the hell not? Why can't you wipe these mofos off the face of the earth and stop the cancer they cause in our society? Well, we're going to get stuck into them and we, we're, going to re- we're going to have a really good crack at severely reducing their numbers and disrupting them and, um, and curtailing the massive harm that they create in our communities. But the short answer to why you can't get rid of them entirely, Sean, is that as long as humankind's been around and we've had societies, there are bad people, inherently bad people, that will always be bad people. All right, uh, Mark Mitchell, I thank you very much indeed for your time this morning and the cell phone experiment with our technology seems to have worked particularly well uh, this morning. I thank you for your time. That is Mitchell, uh, Mark Mitchell, National's uh, police spokesperson. Well, some of it's rhetoric, um, but something has to be done. And as I said on Friday, it's not just gangs, it's not just ram raids. We seem to have lost our way on law and order, and I'm not one who thinks it's a particularly appealing and often it's a misused political tool, the law and order issue, but something is wrong in the country right now, and something needs something needs desperately to change, in my humble opinion.